good morning and welcome to worship today. It's a special Sunday today. We're going to be sharing in the Lord's table, so I would encourage you to get the elements together for our time around the Lord's table, get some bread, get something to drink, and then be prepared to use those symbols to remind us that we are the body of Christ, members one with another, and that it's the blood of Christ that flows through us and unites us. As we begin worship today, I want to extend a special welcome to each one that's here and to the residents of the Hopkins Center who will be joining us by video this afternoon. It's a joy to be able to expand our worship service in that way, and we'd love to be able to share, with, share it with others as well. As we begin our worship, I've asked Shannon Thompson to share with us and to read some of our scripture this morning. Shannon? I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. The, my God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangle me. The torrents of destruction overwhelm me. The cords of grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. This is God's word as we begin our time of worship together this morning. As we gather each week, we take time to confess our sins before God, knowing that God is faithful and righteous and will forgive our sins. And so let us join together in the prayer of confession as you'll see it on your screen. With hearts of sorrow, we come before you, O God, to confess what you already know. We have failed to keep your laws. Again and again, we've followed our own selfish will rather than your holy and life-giving will for our lives. We've twisted your decrees and institutions to suit our preconceptions and interests rather than your own. Forgive us, O God, and cleanse us from hidden faults that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts may be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. My friends, having confessed our sins, God has promised that he is faithful and righteous and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Know you are forgiven. Receive God's grace and live each day as forgiven people. Let us join now in singing as uh, Mark accompanies with us.
And so we know that our life is found in God. That's where our hope is found. That's where we can join together in sharing. Our children's sermon this morning is brought to us by Patsy. And she's prepared some thoughts about what it means to grow and how seeds are part of our life. Good morning. So the lesson today is going to be one of Jesus' stories that he tells in the Bible, which doesn't seem to be like a really big story at all. It does have to do with seeds and growing. Here's my plant that's growing from what we planted at church, although I planted mine a little late, probably others are much bigger. Um, so in Mark 4, Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. Pretty simple little story. So if those seeds have the right conditions to grow, they will grow. We can't see what's going on under the earth, but when those little plants peep up, it's like a miracle. It's exciting, isn't it? So you go from this, I just bought these tomato seeds. They're so tiny. I don't even know if you can see them. We go from that to this. Love it. So, like I said, it's not much of a story. You plant a tomato seed, you get a tomato. So why did Jesus tell this parable? And what is a parable exactly? We, we talk about those a lot. Jesus uses that a lot to tell us things. So I looked it up. I love reading definitions about words. Do you? Anyway, a parable is a simple story, right? Who said that? Used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson as told by Jesus in the Bible. Here's another definition, though, that I just love. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. I really like that. I'm going to remember that. So we know that seeds need certain conditions in order to sprout, and then plants need the right circumstances in which to grow. So they need good soil, sunshine, and water. So Jesus is assuming that the plants in this story already have that. What he wants us to remember is that the real work of growing that plant is up to God. We don't have to stand on the sidelines and cheer for it. We don't have to beg it, please, pretty please, with sugar on it, will you grow? That seed is going to do what it's meant to do because God told it so. So remember how the parable started about this is the kingdom of God. This is what the kingdom of God is like. So the kingdom of God, that, that isn't some place we can drive to or fly to. We're already a part of the kingdom of God because we know that Jesus is God's son. So we're already there. We are in the kingdom of God, which is a great place for us. So he's saying God's kingdom will grow. And we can help by planting the seed, which is us sharing our love of God with others. So when we share God with others, we really don't know what's going to happen next. We have no control over what happens with that person, but God does. Just like a seed in the soil. When we have a conversation with somebody about God, or about prayer, about Jesus. We tell someone about Bible school, even our dinners at church when we're handing those out to people. That's sharing God with everyone. So that's, here's the good part. We don't need to think it's all up to us. It's like that little seed secretly growing beneath the dirt. We may not even know that God is working in someone's heart after we share him with them, but we can trust that what he decides to do, he will do. And that's a pretty good story after all. Will you bow in prayer with me? Thank you, Jesus, for all the good parables. Thank you for teaching us to share the good news. And thank you, God, for helping our seeds about Jesus grow in people's hearts. We love being farmers for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
uh, the kingdom of God is among us and within us. And to be able to live as kingdom citizens is a special privilege. I've asked Shannon to also read this scripture for us today. But before we do, I want to talk with her just a couple minutes. Shannon, you may not realize it or may not have realized it before now. But today marks one year of our being virtual in church. A full year of dealing with pandemic. A year since you were last in school full time. Tell me, how the, what have you learned over this year? Um, I've learned to be like a little bit more patient because sometimes all the technology doesn't work all the time. Oh. And it's really like slow. Yeah, we, we've kind of experienced that as well. Have you, uh, what are you eager to get back to? Um, I'm really excited to like get back to doing school in person because it's sometimes hard doing it virtual because the teacher's teaching the kids that are in person, but also they're teaching the kids that are virtual that day. That would be hard on the teacher too, wouldn't it? And do, you, off, do you know any teachers who try to deal with something like that? Um, well, my dad also has to do that because he's a teacher. And yeah, they actually just started doing it like they teach the kids in person. But like if it's a cohort B day, if there's anybody remote from that cohort B, they have to teach it those people online, which is like they just start in that. And that's really hard, like teaching mm -hmm. people in person and then teaching the people who are online. Is it hard for you students as well? Yeah. Yeah. Well, before you read scripture, I'd just like to have a word of prayer with you, for you and all the other students and teachers, okay? Lord Jesus, I do pray for Shannon today as she seeks to navigate this very, very strange time in which we live. Thank you for her willingness to share with us today. I pray for strength for her and for her teachers. I thank you for the things that you're teaching her. And I ask that the lessons of patience may be something that we all have an opportunity to learn. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you read us our scripture from Mark 4? He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seeds on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though, he's, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Thank you so much. In each of our lives, we have lessons that we must learn. And as even a very young person, one of the first lessons I learned about patience was this. Never pray for patience. God will make things rougher on you so that you'll learn it. Maybe you've heard that as well. You, you need troubles in order to grow your patience muscles. Well, folks, we've all had the opportunity to grow patience muscles over this last year. How can we continue that process and put things into effect in our lives? Our theme this week and throughout the season of Lent has been growth as Christians. We talked about growing in prayer. We talked about growing during this season. We talked about growing in generosity. And today we're going to talk about growing in patience. And while I began by saying never pray for patience because God will make things harder on you, I think that praying for patience is exactly what God calls us to do. He's not waiting for us to step out of line to make things rougher. 
but he's waiting to walk with us, to open our eyes to what God is doing all around us. When Jesus told parables about the kingdom of God, he often included stories about farmers, seeds, and harvest. A couple weeks ago, we looked at the parable of the sower and the seed. Jesus told stories about weeds in a field, about vineyards, about harvesting and threshing grain. In one parable, immediately following this one, Jesus talked about a tiny mustard seed that grows into a massive weed. I think the reason Jesus often turned to images like the mustard seed was because of the potential in the seed. Think about those marigold seeds that many of you planted a couple weeks ago. The potential in that little seed, even hard to see, to look and to see that seed and then to imagine what it might become. Boy, it stretches the imagination. But within every seed is a blueprint of the flower or the vegetable or the plant that will be growing. The seed contains that print for the stem and the leaves and the flowers. But we all know that it won't become a flower this afternoon. We can't put a seed in the ground and then at 3 o'clock have a full-grown plant. And so while we know the potential, what we learn is that the seed is just a seed without soil, water, and light. We may not know the specifics about how it happens, but with those components, it will happen. The potential is there. The possibility is real. The question is, will we wait for the process? Our society has primed us to expect instant results from whatever we do. Everything from instant potatoes to new car vending machines all tell us we can have whatever we want now. And it's getting more and more that way every single day. From same-day delivery on, to on-demand television, we need not wait for anything. And I'm going to tell you, that is a wonderful convenience. But when the instant delivery is not available, or there's fear that we won't be able to get what we want when we want it, the strangest behaviors begin to manifest themselves in our lives. Remember just a year ago, when there was literally a run on toilet paper. People panicked that they wouldn't be able to get those paper products. If it might snow and we can't, might not be able to get out, bread and milk and eggs sell like lemonade on a hot Sunday afternoon. We are people who live in the moment. And when we're told we must wait, our primary reaction is to rebel. Today, as we journey through this pandemic, we have to wait. We have to wait a little longer before our church reopens for public gathering. We have to wait for our vaccines. We have to wait for schools to open. Many of us have to wait in order to hug our grandchildren or our grandparents. We've got to wait. Am 
We don't like it. But guess what? The farmer cannot speed up the seed. The farmer can't force the growth. The farmer must learn patience. <laughs> when I was a child, I was in uh, 4-H, and I had a flower garden for my project. A couple of times during that summer, it felt like I was behind others who had flower gardens. And so I would go out to the garden and I would try to encourage those little seedlings to grow faster by pulling on them. What do you think happened, Shannon? Yeah, they came out of the ground. It did not work at all. It failed. You see, growth happens, but we cannot force it to happen. We must learn patience. But it's not only things that we want immediately. We also want people to immediately reach maturity. We want people to make changes when evidence is presented. We want our friends to care about the things that are important to us. As a pastor, I long to see people find the freedom in Christ that I've come to embrace. Forty-five years ago, I entered Bible college. For the next eight years, through college and a year in the marketplace, and then three years in seminary, I grew in my faith and in my understanding of the implications of my faith. When I started pastoring a small church in rural north central West Virginia, I wanted the wonderful people that I met from Hepzibah Baptist Church to discover the implications and joy and freedom that can come in their faith. So I started to tell them about the call to justice. I shared with them the importance of recognizing our responsibility to believers around the world. I shared with them what had enriched my life as I studied the Bible. And I dumped it all on them at once. I forgot that my faith had grown and developed because of eight years of study and prayer and exploration that had been most all that I did in my life. <laughs> I even forgot the pain that I'd experienced as my faith was challenged and stretched and I laid out all my discoveries for this congregation. When I did it, I abandoned any thought of patience. I was experimenting once again with stretching seedlings, hoping they would grow faster. Even today, I can become impatient with people I love if they don't embrace truth when I present it. The arrogance of that statement hurts my heart. I must ask forgiveness. It's not my task to force you or anyone else to embrace the truth that I've discovered. I can share it. I can present it. But it's up to God to provide any kind of harvest. You see, this parable tells us that waiting brings rewards. Notice that the farmer plants the seed and then he continues to live in the hope that the seed will produce a crop. He works, he sleeps, he gets up, he goes about his life, and the seed does its thing. It grows with soil, with water, with air, as Patsy reminded us earlier, God's designed seeds to grow when the conditions are right. The process of growing in patience reminds us that the little things we see are not the whole picture. 
we can see just a tiny glimpse of what God wants to create in us and in others. Per perhaps, like me, you have found yourself focusing on what God's doing in your life, expecting God to do the same thing in the lives of others. You see, we only see a part of the picture. And when we focus on that tiny piece, we miss the big picture. As you watch the next minute and 30 seconds of this clip, think about what you're seeing. As the clip continues and the big picture comes into focus, what's going through your mind? Then ask the question, what is the big picture God wants to reveal to you? The big picture is often a whole lot different than the opening scene, isn't it? We are able to see only a small glimpse of what God's doing in our lives and especially in the lives of the people around us. It may appear that people are facing a little swell and they're doing pretty well with it as they're being towed along. But as we get the bigger picture, we suddenly realize that they're racing down the face of the biggest wave they will ever face. At, at the picture, while losing sight, look at those details and lose sight of what God wants to do in our lives. To grow in patience is to learn to look at the big picture, but to never forget the small and what seem to be insignificant details. You see, God is looking for people that we often overlook because all we see is the seed. It requires patience to believe that the seed is not all there is. Misty Mowry tells the story of a man who bought a house with a short, broad tree in the backyard. It was winter. The tree appeared dead and bare. When spring came, the tree grew leaves and tiny pink buds. <laughs> this is wonderful, the man thought, a flower tree. I'm going to enjoy these flowers all summer. But before he had time to enjoy the flowers, the wind began to blow and all the petals were strewn in the yard. <laughs> what a mess, he thought. This tree isn't any use after all. The, the summer passed, and one day the man noticed 
the fruit was full, the, the tree was full of green fruit, the size of large nuts. He picked a large one and took a bite. Yuck! He threw it to the ground. What a horrible taste. This tree is worthless. Its flowers are so fragile, the wind blows them away. The fruit is terrible and bitter. When winter comes, I'm cutting it down. <laughs> the tree took no, no, no notice of the man and continued to draw water from the soil and warmth from the sun and in late fall produced crisp red apples. Some of us see Christians with their early blossoms of happiness and think they should be that way forever. Or we see bitterness in their lives and we're sure they'll never bear fr the fruit of joy. But could it be that we've forgotten that the best fruit often ripens late? To grow in patience is to see the bigger picture. The seed is small, but we can't force it to grow. The blade looks fresh, but that's not what wheat was intended to be. The head lends beauty and weight to the blade, but it's only at the end of its life that the grain is filled with nutrients and can be of use. Learning to wait for God is to complete the work that God's doing in our lives and in the lives of others. It is certainly one of the most difficult tasks we face. But like the farmer, we can be sure that God is working in us and in the people we encounter. And if that is true, we can wait and sleep and live our lives knowing that God will bring all of creation to maturity. As we prepare to go to the Lord in prayer, I would encourage you to take another piece of your prayer paper, I would ask you, what is your prayer for patience in your life? My prayer is that God would give me eyes to see the bigger picture without losing sight of the individual in the midst of it. My prayer is that God would open my heart, and my eyes. To those who are struggling with learning God's truth, I encourage you to jot that prayer down right now. Let us join together. Father, show us what it means to grow in patience. Teach us how to grow in you and lead us in your path. Forgive us for trying to force growth and show us what it means to wait on you. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Oh, God, may I have eyes to see your big picture. This morning, part of that big picture is coming to understand and share in the Lord's table. 
And so as we come, as we nourish our plants, may we also be nourished through the gifts of Christ's body and blood. Let's join together now and sing in preparation for the Lord's table. As we prepare to receive the Lord's table, I've asked Shannon to come and share with us again and to help us with communion. You see, communion is about community. When we're all by ourselves, it's hard to experience that community. So Shannon, would you read the words of institution that the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11? For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This, is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this when, whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Not a problem. These symbols of Jesus' body and blood, packaged and small, as we share them together, here, I got this one. Here, sometimes. Because Jesus said, whenever you eat it, you declare my death, and my resurrection until I come. The gifts of bread and wine are like the gifts of air and water and light to a seed. As we share in these symbols of Christ's body today, let us bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you that you've given us these symbols. Thank you for Jesus who gave his life for us. Thank you for his example and thank you for his victory. Teach us to walk in Jesus' footsteps. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. It's Jesus' body given for us. Let us share it together.
And this is a symbol of Jesus' blood that has been shed for us. Let us share it together. These gifts are God's gifts to us. Thank you, Shannon, for helping us to remember that we are a body. We're brought together through Jesus, and we move forward in his steps. Now, as our closing music is played, may you find the prayer that is needed in your life that patience may grow. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, make you complete, working in you everything that is good and pleasing in his sight. May you grow in prayer, in generosity, in patience. And may you find that God has changed you as we approach that time when we celebrate resurrection. Now go in peace. Amen.